Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster. Today, I'm with our regular guest, Dr. Martin Lindley, and we're joined by Head of Strength and Conditioning at Loughborough University, Chris Wright, and Strength and Conditioning Coaches, Stephen Bresner and Adam Whitney. We're here to talk about athletes returning to training as lockdown restrictions are removed after the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll discuss what athletes have been doing during lockdown and how it may have affected them. And we'll look further into how coaches are preparing for athletes to return to training. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Hi Martin. Hello. We're going to be talking today about athletes returning to training because there's a lot of athletes returning to training right now. Um, But before we get into that and the ins and outs of what they should and shouldn't be doing, Chris, can you just talk to us and explain a little bit about what athletes have been doing in lockdown and potentially how that's affected their training status? Yeah, so I I guess it's it's a massive switch in terms of the amount of training they would have been doing pre-lockdown to potentially what it is now. Um, Some athletes in various sports previously training kind of 10, 15 hours a week and competing. Um, It's obviously very, very different. For example, if if you're a swimmer, um, you can't access a pool right now. If you're a weightlifter, you can't access a gym right now. So it it causes lots of different challenges um, and has provided kind of great opportunity for athletes to take ownership of their own training um, and, and try and problem solve. I think in Loughborough Sports specifically, like the S&C team have worked extremely hard to try and provide innovation, new training stimuluses to support the athletes, regardless of their situation, environment, et cetera, to make sure that that if and when we do get the call um, to return to training, that we're in the best possible possible shape to do that. And I think um, what, what the guys have done really well is is it's been a really measured approach in terms of the S&C team have, have looked and they do it on a day-to-day basis anyway. Looking at their sport, what is the outcome of the sport? For example, is it winning the league? Um, is it winning a, um, a, a, a race uh, competition, etc.? And then what are the things that are potentially going to get in the way of that success or potentially um, aid their performance and then training in and around that? Um, so I, Steve hopefully will, will allude to some of the work he's done in rugby because a, a great example of that is is the girls haven't um, experienced tackling for potentially four months when they return to training. So just an opportunity for him to talk around what, they, what they've tried to do in that situation to bridge that gap is, pre- is probably a good, a good example of, of the measured approach that the team's taken. That'd be brilliant. It'd be great to hear from, from Stephen in, in, in just a minute. Before we do, can you just... Just briefly explain the amount of athletes that we have and the, the diversity of those athletes that you, you have to manage through your team. Um, so I, I believe um, we've got around 18 performance sports that we work with. That's including kind of the gender split on hockey programs and, and stuff like that. We've not only got invasion games um, such as hockey and football, um, we've also got linear sports such as cycling, um, athletics across the board. Um, we also support, and, and Steve may speak on that, TAS athletes that may not actually be Loughborough sports specific, um, but Loughborough University will be their hub. So working with that, that also includes para athletes. Um, so we've got, got a big spectrum. Um, some of the coaches, S&C coaches, may be looking after 60 to 80 athletes across two sports um, if they're working with kind of two invasion game teams. Um, so there's quite a, the coaches are working with quite a, a high number, but hopefully only specifically looking after after two sports. So it's it's quite a unique environment, really, where we can have so many different strength and conditioning coaches looking after so many different sports. So it's, it'll be really interesting to hear the kind of differences of, of, of the approaches that you've been taken. So, Chris, you mentioned Stephen. So, Stephen, can you give us a bit of an insight into the work that you've been doing with rugby? Yeah, so we had um, we had our season cancelled quite early on. I think it was uh, a week or two weeks after everyone went into self isolation. So that that helped us be able to plan because we knew that 
um, we we didn't have a we didn't have a sort of date somewhere in the future where we might have to be ready to play, whether it would be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. So that enables us to to kind of plan uh, up until next season. And one of the things we found that some of the players they had a lot of stuff at home, so we could be we could be quite uh, similar with what they would be doing at this moment in time uh, if the season was carrying on. But then there was others that didn't have anything. So it was about planning around what what the majority of players ha- have or don't have and almost just being comfortable with if someone doesn't have anything apart from a Ferro band, then trying to chase certain adaptations like maximal strength or hypertrophy and to a certain extent, you're not going to be able to elicit those those changes with, with the equipment. So focusing on areas that we could actually change. And in terms of in terms of returning to to training, is that going to cause a problem if you've got a team where you've got somebody who's been able to continue their strength training and actually progress during this time, and then some others who have probably gone backwards? What what are you expecting to see, and, and how are you going to kind of mitigate against that? Uh, so, like Chris said, there was um, we've got some people who haven't played since uh, February, even January. So they've not been into contact uh, in a match situation. They haven't been scrummaging or line outs or they do line outs or anything like that. So there need to be a phased phased return to anything like that, particularly around uh, tackling. So there's a lot of things that we're putting in place to try and again, focus on the things that we can change. So building up to pre-season that all uh, hopefully start at a certain date, but obviously that's still up in the air. Uh, focus on things like we can uh, run a lot now because the restrictions are less. We can do a lot of capacity-based work. So it's focusing on the areas that we can change that are then going to build a good base to come back into. And then that first week of pre-season, uh, we'll look at a few markers, again, focused around the stuff that everybody can do. Uh, but bearing in mind that some people could be further ahead than others just by what they've got at home. So, Stephen, you, you, you've mentioned there that the uh, the rugby have suffered and that they've not been able to do the, the rugby specific contact work. Uh, Chris mentioned earlier that the weight trainers can't get in the gym and the swimmers can't get in the pool. Have you found that you've been able to sort of cross fertilize ideas from different sports? Have you been able to sort of work with other athletes and other groups to try and get best practice from what they've been able to do and transfer that into your sport? I suppose that's one of the luxuries of working with Loughborough University is that there's a lot of different coaches and a lot of different sports. And then there's obviously a ton of information that's out there on social media and things like that. So it's almost... uh, taking all of that information and then uh, picking out the the best bits that are going to apply for the context that I'm working in. So one of the things that the team, the SNC team at Loughborough have done uh, different types of like coffee club and meetings where people are sharing, sharing ideas across across the different SNC coaches and certain things like how are we going to keep the players kind of motivated and involved in training and different types of challenges and things like that. So being able to chat through different ideas like that, particularly around athlete engagement, was really useful. Just in terms of um, those ideas, like there's there's been lots of, the, the team's been really great at kind of coming up with with novel ideas of kind of increasing autonomy of, of training, but also challenge them in the right environment. Um, I know Adam working with a men's football program um, had, a, had a nice competition going on early on in the stage. It, it might be useful to get his his uh, insight on how he handled it on the team sport. Adam, Adam, over to you. Um, yeah, very similar, similar to Stephen. Do you know what I mean? What we've kind of, or I've gone down the route of more during this difficult time, more of a kind of supportive role through this isolation difficulty. So yeah, we are providing different stimulus for these uh, gentlemen to do and and to continue to do to keep their kind of conditioning or capacity level up, what we can do and kind of keeping that on field base, some heart rate work or tempo work. Um, But we are as well going down the education route, you know what I mean, and giving packs on myofascial release or nutrition kind of information so that that's been drip fed through this isolation as well as I think like 
Chris has said, for us, it was the motivation. How do you motivate individuals that um, are stuck in a house, don't have much equipment, and they're doing, you know, programming-wise, tempo lifting? You know, it can get monotonous. Uh, how do we invigorate these these lads to enjoy what they're doing and, and to interact with these people that they have for a full season all of a sudden dispersing? So we kind of like I think a lot of the the S and Cs have done competitions, uh, and we certainly did ones using Strava. I know Stephen's done some of them as well. You know who can get who can who whose run can look closest to an A shape, etc. Um, who can run in a five k in the closest uh, the fastest time, etc. Things like that. So and we kind of got a league table from that, and and the, the guys kind of enjoyed and bought into that, which was pleasing on on the football side of things. That sounds sounds good. Have other, have other people taken that those kind of ideas on and, and used that throughout other teams? Think, and yeah, I think from the yes, SNCs you spoke to because it's it's quite a tight group and sharing ideas. I, I, I'll be honest, I stole plenty of ideas from individuals from different sports on the competitions, and and I'm guessing we all kind of had the same consensus and and did similar things. So it was really useful to come together and uh, and provide the best kind of support, whether that is different runs or you know it could be manipulated for football we did a kind of keep you up challenge that i got the head coach to write a challenge the kind of nutritionist wrote a challenge the physio wrote a challenge so it was kind of a, a good mdt kind of experience as well and good for me coming into the environment didn't know many people so that helped me personally from my own isolation kind of difficulties so it sounds like there's been some great ideas to keep um, keep the team going keep the motivation going how do you how has it affected their potential performance so where are they where are you expecting them to be at or is it is it a we've got no idea we'll wait and see when they come back in with, with regards to football i know the guys have kept clear communication what they have been doing what we've delivered to them so we kind of know that everyone has been partaking in a certain amount of conditioning on field like Stephen said, I think when coming in, there'll be diagnostics just to kind of see where everyone stands and, and then a modified pre-season based off uh, the individuals and the mixed kind of preparation they've done. Just, just out of interest in, with this, have they had a rest period? Because are they have they taken any of this as a pre-season or a, an off-season, sorry, or have people just continued to train and are they going to be coming back into training fully loaded? Where are we with that? So... Chris and then Stephen. Um, so I think just just as a general point, it's it's a really good one um, because it's like I said at the start, people have gone from potentially training and competing 15, 20 hours a week to then that that's a big chunk of their life that's taken away. So it's, it would be really easy in conversations I've had of like, oh, people suddenly finding that they love running and um, biking when they were. Um, in the Loughborough sport environment, a rugby player, for example. Um, so that some might be trying to replace that training volume with, with others. Um, so the, the guys have been, guys and girls have been great at kind of keeping on top of that and monitoring. And like from, from a netball point of view, there's certain, I, I don't particularly interested in running over a certain large distance because it's, it's not really their sport. Um, but the take it, taking a break point is, is a really valid one. Um, so from, from my experiences, particularly, uh, the netball season only got formally cancelled on uh, yesterday, I believe it was. So we're having a period now of a few weeks of just shutting down while, while we look to maintain um, and look at when the season may start again. So I, And I think what was really valuable to us was having clear aims. So in the first six weeks of, of lockdown, it was just about being healthy and happy. So a lot of the conversations and a lot of the, the competitions that we had were team orientated to try and get that social interaction going. Um, then we moved into a period of, of being prepared after that. And that was either to be locked down for longer or to go back to training. Um, three weeks into that period, we now had the league cancelled. So we know what we're preparing for. So we made that decision to take a break and then look at training more kind of individually from a technical point of view than a physical point of view. But I think structuring that break in in a time, and I've, I've said the same to the staff as well, like to, it's really easy not to take a break because you're at home all the time. Why bother taking a vacation? It, it's the same from an athlete point of view. They, they need that time at, 
an opportunity to have that decompress from the rigours of training. That's brilliant because I know Marcy and I, we've, we've done a couple of podcasts already on the immune system and lowering training load, actually enhancing the immune system. And also we've got a nutrition one as well. So they're quite interesting podcasts that I think a lot of the athletes may have listened to. Um, Stephen, did you want to add add anything to that? Uh, yeah, it was um, when we found out, when we first went into self-isolation and found out that the season had been cancelled, we got together as a coach and staff team and decided to carry on training up until when the season would have theoretically finished. Um, and then and then off the back of that, uh, we've got a break and then there's a, there's a break kind of continuing up till pre-season, even though uh, there's certain things that will be sent out um, to do during that kind of pre, uh, pre-pre-season pre phase. Um, one of the reasons was when we're in self-isolation uh, initially, and if uh, if the girls went on break, they'd, they'd just be sat at home. They wouldn't be able to go on holiday or see even like go to their, see their friends and family. So I decided that at that moment in time, for the for the players, it probably wasn't the best idea to say go on go on your breaks now and then uh, we'll start working. And at that moment in time, we didn't know how long it would have lasted. So we could have said that they would be coming back into training just as everything was shut uh, was opening back up again, and then they could have actually had genuine breaks. Um, but what we found with most of the players, even even though they've got time off uh, without any any training at this moment in time most of the training's a bit of an outlet. It means that they're able to get out of the house and do something and do something they enjoy um, because most of the other things they enjoy, they can't do at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it sounds like some great approaches that you've taken during, during lockdown. Um, Martin, you got something to add to that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's quite interesting that the, the, the level of athletes we're dealing with, they are very much elite athletes. And I think one of the one of the issues people have is to slow them down and control them <laughs> from doing too much. And we've heard from the immune function and the nutrition that it's the the reduction in volume and the rest period is actually very important for their their ability to fight off virus, their ability to recover and their ability to train and perform optimally. So it's interesting to hear that that you're getting some sort of well-structured breaks in there. Uh, but I'd still see the message coming across that their recovery time and their downtime is, although it may not be the best thing for them mentally, uh, there is the need for that physical rest from not maybe their muscles, but from their actual immune system. Uh, yeah, just jumping on that, kind of from a football perspective, what we did is we kind of coincided rightly or wrongly um, their kind of break or kind of deload in in conjunction with when they had a vast amount of coursework and exams going on. So we didn't want to be kind of producing these kind of exercise programs uh, and and almost making them feel like they had to fit that in when they were already having a mass amount of stress going on. So we kind of that was where we pinpointed an area just to reduce their kind of training volume. It adds a lot really to to the environment that you guys are in which is obviously different from a lot of the professional athletes regarding there's a lot more to think about than just, you know, ju- just their performance. You've got to think about their education as well. So that's, that's quite an interesting point. Um, should we, should we move forward? I mean, you've already mentioned what, what athletes have been doing. You've mentioned that they're going to come back and, and do some testing. Um, but moving forward, what are you going to be doing as they come back in? And do you have any knowledge of when they're coming back in, um, when competitions might start and what do you need to help you? In terms of to answer the logistical questions of um, when, at, th- at this stage we don't know. Um, part of it is government guidelines and, and it has to kind of come from the very, very top in terms of decision of when kind of entertainment could or could not start and, and sport and so on and so forth. So it, it's very up in the air. Um, so although we have plans and strategies in place um, for different for different sports on different scenarios it's just the plans are there so we've got something to refer to when we do get the nod um, so as a result we've, we're not able to really um, look at a, um, a traditional 
pre-season period for a team sport or a competition period for, for more of the linear based sports that compete in the summer. Um, in terms of in terms of the kind of the process of returning, it's it's probably better to speak to kind of Steve and Adam on that one, uh, given that they're working with more more sports than myself. Let's just touch on Martin. In terms of um, the things that we should be thinking about theoretically, what what ideas have, have you got? And then we'll see where that fits with practically what's going on. Well, there's I mean there's sort of two sides to it really. There's the there's the top tips on on coming back, <coughs> which is essentially being very careful about the increase in training load so not increasing the intensity and the duration but doing one or the other and it being specific to your sport so some sports may be increasing volume others may be increasing intensity uh, there's the monitoring that these guys are doing so well anyway uh, and then making sure that you can track the monitoring of your training adaptations but specifically to covid to also keep an eye on the monitoring of the symptoms because the crossover is, and we did a uh, we did quite a large uh, physiological society webinar yesterday with 650 700 people on it, uh, talking about how we can get people back into testing situations, and they're talking about high level exercise uh, in groups or individually or outdoors versus indoors. So th there is still that risk involved. So even when the government lets us back out and we can get back to training and playing properly, there'll still be social distancing issues. And I think that will have an impact on specifically the team sports, the rugby and the football and the hockey, netball, et cetera, more so than the individual linear cycling and running. Some interesting points. I think, Stephen, have you got something to add to that? Or Yeah, kind of linking in with Martin's point, and uh, I'm not, by no means an expert in, but I know that a lot of new information is coming out about how... Um, how COVID uh, affects certain populations and certain people. And because there's there's a lot of people who might have had it and had no symptoms, very mild symptoms, then uh, we could have uh, players and athletes coming in who have had it. And uh, again, if they're in some of those at-risk populations with either underlying respiratory disorders or underlying heart conditions, then uh, there could be an effect with reintroduction to training from a health perspective with those people that we just we don't know because they've got something that's maybe small and undiagnosed but underlying and they've had had COVID and we just don't know. Yeah, I think, I think that's quite an important point. In general, the message is that any youngsters uh, are being uh, very resilient and is not having much of an effect. Uh, and the situation is usually that the symptoms are related to viral load. So the bigger viral load, the more likely you are to have symptoms. But what we don't know is what impact that low viral load is having on individuals and especially in athletes who are pushing the envelope of their physical performance. We do a lot of research where we look at, uh, for instance, elite athletes and compare them to a disease populations. An 80 year old COPD patient is actually a good model for an elite aerobic athlete because they're both operating at the very utmost limits of their performance. It's, it seems a bit confusing that a, a, a sick elderly person is a good model for an athlete, but your athletes are, are pushing themselves to the limit and we don't have that in the normal population. So I think we're going to have to have extra monitoring and just be extra vigilant to pick up on any signs of symptoms or issues, which is where the monitoring, the training diaries and the hands on SNC coach work is going to be very important. Chris, I think you, did you want to add anything to that of what we're actually yeah. doing? Your plans are, yeah. So I, I think, like, um, I think Martin may raise some great points. So I just kind of want to want to touch on two of them. I think um, the conversation just there between Martin and Steve is is massive uh, because it is it is an unknown, um, and I know that the physiotherapy team as part of Loughborough Sport are doing a doing a great job and a lot of work into what this may look like. Um, coming down and especially those individuals that may have had it but not displayed the symptoms and how they may present when um, when training etc um, just to almost give cues to coaches SNCs etc to be like oh this person may be responding in this way because um, so I, I agree with your point there Martin I think that the vision and awareness of the practitioners that are working with those athletes and also the 
to uh, for the athletes to understand the difference between what may be a symptom and what may be just training at a higher level feels like when you haven't had that kind of stimulus before i think is really important um the other point i just wanted to touch on was you mentioned specificity um so progressive overload is is really important but i think the in our environment within loft for sport working with like i said eight, 18 different performance sports like the specificity of that sport and making sure we're prepared for that going back in um and the guys in the team are doing a great job like um steve mentioned about capacity and stuff like that so making sure that, that the guys have the muscular capacity specifically for their sport so when they can come back they um can continue to to train at at a level so there is a little bit of a known coming back in um in terms of muscular capacity in certain certain risk heights yeah that all makes a, a lot of sense and i think what martin said before about monitoring and and i know we're looking at doing a podcast with some of the physios to look at a bit more in depth into that side of things potential future injury looking at where that capacity might sit and, and what signs and symptoms to pick up on uh, hopefully we're going to record that next week so We've only got kind of a few minutes left. So would would you guys like to kind of summarize for anybody who's listening to this, either an athlete or an SNC coach who are starting to think and plan about the return to training, what tips would you give them to help them with, with their athletes? I just say kind of plan with the end, plan with the end in mind. So what what are you trying to achieve? What's your outcome? And then work backwards from that to make sure that that outcome is achievable. And from looking at your outcome and planning backwards, you'll start to see what the what the risks are um, to either you coming back or, I don't know, let's use a marathon as an example. You want to complete a marathon in, in sub three hours. Um, so you, your pace is going to be important. What's the risk factors that are going to prevent you achieving that pace? And look at it at that point of view. So have your outcome, plan backwards, know what, know what your strengths are, but also know the things that could limit you especially in this period. Brilliant. What, what about what, what things are you going to be monitoring as, as athletes come back in? Stephen, you got anything you'll be looking for? The first few things are more around the stuff that we can change during this time. So uh, some capacity markers and some, some aerobic markers and uh, like running base markers. Um, and then in terms of the stuff that if some of the players and other athletes have got substantial gyms, then uh, they could have been they could have been loading effectively for for like uh, maximal force production things like that. But just being wary that a lot of our players and athletes haven't been, so we won't be doing anything like that at the start of pre-season and look to kind of build it in gradually throughout the season. So we're we're mitigating any risk for injury performing some of those maximal tests early on. I think I agree with the guys as in we've got to be quite cautious when these individuals come back into their their you know their pre-season that there's not a giant spike in load and if we have got access to GPS that we're monitoring each individual because the pre-seasons will certainly have to be modified uh, based off the kind of the mixed group and the mixed preparation like Stephen's saying some group of have, have no gyms at home some are lucky enough to have that facility and so there will definitely be a mixed group coming in and, and we have to be conscious of that and and seek out and and with the physios and the mdt look for those kind of areas of uh, all of those individuals that are uh, more um likely to be to gain injury etc through those monitoring tools and wellness tools a message for the athletes that are listening to this podcast would be that the main thing you need to do is listen to your s and c coaches the ones we've got here have demonstrated they've got a fantastic breadth of knowledge and are working together really well as a team, but they're, they're only as good as, as much as the athletes are listening and follow the advice they're given. And I think, Martin, I think that's a very valid point. And all of us have worked with athletes at some point um, and experienced things in different ways. And in my experience, some athletes will push themselves beyond what they're being told and some will not bother pushing themselves as hard. Now, the more they listen to their coach and get where they're meant to be, the, the, the easier life will become, I think, is a great kind of leaving message. Guys, it's been brilliant to speak to you. Hopefully, we'll look at some future podcasts and we'll be doing some more things with S&C coaches and physios in the future. But for now, it's, uh, it's back to lockdown and, and back to more Zoom calls. So thanks, guys. Thank you very much. 
Cheers. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.